Okay, so this is the way one practices moderation in eating. Of course, not only does one reflect in this way, but also when one takes the food, one has to be moderate in the quantities one takes. So it's usually advised not to eat until one's stomach is full, but to eat about three quarters of the capacity and then to drink, drink water. <laughs> and if, if you find, if you think that you have the habit of eating too much and it's a kind of habitual addiction, try just eating three quarters of your normal capacity and do it regularly. And after a while, you find that you become accustomed to that three quarters. Then you can go down another step to three quarters of that three quarters. Mm -hmm. And that should be enough, you don't have to go below that. But also get exercise. Don't be lazy, it's important to get exercise, otherwise, even if one doesn't eat much, one starts to gain weight. Okay, so, now the Buddha says, you may think we are possessed of shame and fear of wrongdoing, our bodily, verbal, and mental conduct, and our livelihood have been purified. We guard the doors of the sense faculties, and we are moderate in eating. That much is enough, and you may rest content with that much. But I inform you, I declare to you, you who seek the status of a true ascetic, don't fall short of the goal of the ascetic or the renunciate life while there is still more to be done. Maybe at this point I'll ask whether any questions on what has come up so far. I just want to... The intellectual. Yeah, you know, I just want... It's not really essential, but I just like the students to learn the proper... the hindrances in the proper sequence. It shows that they've been attending to the text and not just trying to fish back into these... into the lake of memory. Yes, please. Well, you were saying not to cover the eye. You can't cover your eyes or cover your ears. and block out the world, but in a retreat, one does that in a sense, like the retreat that's happening here, where you, you don't, you aren't seeing things, and you aren't hearing things, and there's a place for that, isn't there? In, in, in well, you know, what I meant by blocking the eyes is, you know, actually covering up the eyes that one doesn't have any sensory input at all, but what the Buddha actually teaches for the monastics, or even for those in village and training, is of course, one keeps the eyes open, but one just looks, generally, one just looks in front of one's, oneself about five meters, three to five meters ahead of one, unless there's some reason to look up or to look around. And so in this way, if one is just looking around at random, then one tends to pick up sensory input, which could provoke either sensual desire or ill will. But if one keeps the senses under restraint, then one just looks, you know, five meters ahead of one. Then one is just picking up the sensory impressions in the immediate environment. As far as the ear goes, one can't really control the range of the ear. That's the what one hears. But if one is in going to go into a meditation retreat, it will be usually a quiet place, so that the Hearing isn't bombarded with loud and disturbing sounds, and then one can focus more easily on the meditation. Can one overdo that and then not have, and then have a hard time getting back into the noisy world again? Um, I don't think one could overdo it because the quiet itself is beneficial for the meditation, but um, it sometimes takes a little period to readjust to getting back into the world. So maybe, it, that's why often in meditation retreats, 
on the last day or sometimes last two days, they'll allow the meditators to start talking to one another. And that way they'll get used to interacting with people and picking up on the sense impressions that come from human contacts. But oh, wait, just I want to do it. Sometimes it's a look, after one get, gets some experience in meditation, sometimes it's good to choose a place which is not completely silent for the meditation, so that one learns how to deal with sound. You know, it shouldn't be a place where there's like a rock band playing the next building. You know, it shouldn't be maybe practicing <laughs> meditation outside. Madison Square Garden, while there's a, a Rolling Stones concert going on. <laughs> I reveal the extent of my knowledge of the rock world. <laughs> what are the latest bands? Well, the latest, latest bands, because I'm sort of back in the dinosaur. I'm yeah, you're a dinosaur. And Led Zeppelin. Yeah, we're all dinosaurs. <laughs> but, Sometimes a certain amount of normal sound, like cars going by outside, um, occasionally people walking by talking, is useful so that one can practice dealing with sounds that might otherwise be distracted. Yes? I want to know how the, uh, the feelings of instinct and intuition come into, you know, you talk about seeing Jake and not liking the way he does this. You know. In some way, though, instinct and intuition uh, are a survival. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're walking in a dangerous place and you, your instinct says something. No, of course, but has to protect oneself from obvious things. Right, so. but it's, it's hard to make the No, it's, it's, it's not so difficult. Well, basically, just what one has to do is, it's really a matter of protecting the mind from giving rise to states of aversion, repulsion, dislike, yeah. anger, ill will. Yeah. Yeah. But if one is in a dangerous situation, one has to be prudent in avoiding the danger. So all this gets tempered, really. Yeah, yeah. Okay. In fact, there's sutta, Sutta number two, the Sabhasata Sutta, where the Buddha speaks about, he's giving the advice to the monks, he speaks about advising a wild bull, a wild horse, a wild, uh, a, a mad dog, a, a dangerous dog. So it has to protect oneself from danger. And yet, show compassion? You mean towards the wild bull or the wild bull? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> one can have compassion in the mind, but one doesn't stand there. <laughs> if the wild bull is no, going to come. No, totally move away. Yeah. I, I work in a mental hospital, yeah. so. So, some is stuck. Very Anyway, this is a kind of sense training. Okay. It's not dealing with everyday life and all of one's involvements in everyday life, but this is the way to train the senses in order to prepare the mind for going deeper in the meditation. Sorry, I got off the Okay, so let's come to the next factor, and this is called wakefulness. Now we actually come into the direct practice of meditation. So it's called wakefulness here. It's explained, the Buddha will explain, <clears throat> During the day, while walking back and forth and sitting, we will purify our minds of obstructive states. So here he's describing <coughs> a monastic person who's engaged in full-time meditation. And so during the day, the monk or nun will be alternating periods of sitting meditation and walking meditation. This is called Chakmana Bhavana, Chakman Bhavana, the meditation while walking back and forth. So in sitting, it could be mindfulness of the breathing, loving kindness meditation, any suitable meditation subject. 
And when walking back and forth, one will simply be mindful of walking, 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 or right step left, right left, or lifting, pushing, putting down, pressing. And in this way, one is purifying the mind of the obstructive states of the, of the five hindrances. So any hindrance arises, one just dispels it, lets it go, and brings the mind back to the meditation subject. Then in the first watch of the night, again, one practices walking back and forth and sitting, and purifies the mind of obstructive states. But then in the middle watch of the night, we will lie down on the right side in the lion's pose, with one foot overlapping the other, mindful and fully aware, after noting in our minds the time for arising. Exactly what is meant by the first, middle, and last watches of the night, since in the Buddha's time they didn't have clocks, so I don't know exactly how to put them in terms of our clock time. But I would say roughly, let's say the first watch of the night might be from 6 p.m. till 10 p.m. Middle watch could be from 10 p.m. I'm sorry, yeah, 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. Then the last watch from 3 a.m. to maybe 6 a.m. 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. So the middle watch of the night, one can sleep for five hours, but if one is practicing meditation very diligently, the need for sleep will start to diminish till one can sleep quite comfortably, satisfactorily, with four, four hours or even three hours of sleep, because the mind is becoming restful, restful through the practice of meditation. Okay, so then after rising, then in what we call a very early morning, 3, 3 a.m., continuing until <coughs> 6, 7 a.m., again one practices meditation, sitting, walking back and forth, sitting. Okay, so then the Buddha says you may, after doing all of this, you may think that you are doing enough. But again, the Buddha urges the monks not to fall short of the goal of refuge while there is more to be done. And then he explains what is more to be done. And this is called mindfulness and full awareness. Well, now I would actually render the Pali word Sampajanya, clear, comprehension. In Pali, the word rendered uh, in, in Pali, the word rendered as mindfulness is sati. 
and the word rendered here full awareness or clear comprehension is sampajanya. These two factors work very, very closely together, and so it's somewhat difficult to distinguish their exact functions. But the way I understand understand them, mindfulness is, I call this the awareness. It's a little misleading because Jnana Moli rendered Sampajanya as full awareness. But I take mindfulness to be the presence of mind. Clear awareness in the sense of a very simple, basic awareness. Whereas Sampajanya, I render clear comprehension because it involves an element of knowing or as distinguishing. And the word sampajanya comes from the root nya, which means to know, knowledge. And then it has two prefixes, sam, which gives a sense of fullness, and pa, which gives a sense of activity, <coughs> kind of full, active knowing of, in this case, what one is doing and what one is experiencing. So sati, or mindfulness, is that factor that makes the experience, the activity, present to the mind. And then sampajanya, clear comprehension, is what discerns, distinguishes, knows what one is doing. And so the Buddha uses these two terms, usually he applies them to the various activities, the little activities of everyday life. So when one leaves the meditation cushion or the meditation hall to engage in other activities, one doesn't let the mind just slip into carelessness or into, one doesn't let the mind drift, roam and wander but one remains fully present with what one is doing and one distinguishes clearly what one is doing. So remaining present with what one is doing, that is mindfulness, and distinguishing clearly what one is doing is sampajanya, clear comprehension. So the text says, I'm going to change the translation, we will act with clear comprehension when going forward and returning, when going out and coming back. We will act with clear comprehension when looking ahead and looking to the side. We will act it with clear comprehension, with clear comprehension when flexing and extending our limbs, when bending and stretching out the arms and the legs. We will act with clear comprehension when putting on our robes, wearing the robes, and carrying the extra robe and bowl. We will act in clear, with clear comprehension when eating, drinking, consuming food and tasting. So even when putting the food into the mouth, chewing it, swallowing it, one is aware of what one is doing. You know, so usually, and this is quite normal, don't think one shouldn't do this, but when people sit at the table taking a meal, you know, they chat and their minds are on the subject of the conversation and just occasionally they'll be just vaguely aware of taking up the spoon, putting it in the mouth, and chewing the food, tasting it, and then immediately back to the conversation. Did you hear what, Jim, did you hear what Jimmy did the other day? No, <laughs> Instead, when trying to maintain the continuity of mindfulness, of the meditative mind, then when one is taking the food, 
picking it up with a spoon, one knows what one is doing, putting it in the mouth, one is aware of putting it in the mouth, one chewing it, one is doing that with mindfulness and clear understanding, one swallowing the food, one experiencing the taste, one experiences the taste mindfully with clear understanding, when one swallows the food, again with mindfulness and clear understanding. And so every step or every phase in the act of eating is done with mindfulness and clear comprehension. Okay. We will act in full awareness when defecating and urinating. So even when going to the toilet, one knows what one is doing. We will act in full awareness when walking, these are just the little postures, when walking, standing still, sitting down, falling asleep, except in the back of Johnny's car, um, waking up, talking, and keeping silent. Okay, so in all the activities, one maintains the mindfulness and clear comprehension. So you can see that the sequence now is building up step by step into the attainment of the higher stages of meditation and the insight knowledges. But we will deal with that in the next class. Yeah, that will be next week. So maybe any questions on Okay, the question is, can we say that when a person has clear comprehension, they necessarily have mindfulness simultaneously? But when there's mindfulness, there's not necessarily clear comprehension. It seems in theory that that should be possible, but I don't know any texts which speak about this possibility. They always speak, the texts always speak about developing mindfulness and clear comprehension simultaneously. But actually, the case that you brought up is actually, I think, possible. We could take a case maybe of a person who might be walking, maybe very, say, you know, walking very mindfully, in a sense he's aware of taking right step, left step, right step, left step, right step, <coughs> boom, falls into a ditch, because he wasn't clearly comprehending where he was walking. <laughs> so to have clear comprehension, of it, to have clear comprehension when one is walking, one also has to be aware, not just of each step, not just to have the act of walking present, one has to have be aware of the environment in which one is walking. So that, that I would say, is an aspect of clear comprehension. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I, thought, I thought next week we were, we were doing uh, the Sutta 41 in conjunction with the Dharma training course. Is that next week? Mm -hmm. Did I say that? Yeah, but well, the, um, the photocopies of Suda 41 were passed down last week to the Dharma Training Course. Really? Yeah. Because I would have expected that Suda 39 would take two classes. Yes, that's on the schedule. That's on the schedule, but we'll we'll provide the thirty nine for the class. That was that was the the schedule said that we were going to do in forty one next next week, but that's all right, no problem. My schedule. Yes. Another schedule says. Yeah, the schedule on the website says. Schedule thirty nine. On the website. But but there's been a change on the on the schedule because. There's a couple of classes that were... Yeah, maybe around. because I missed... Yes, I think that's why yeah. we're... Because I know Sutta 39 is difficult, virtually impossible to do in one class. 
one of your many emails you'll see is one from me asking you what suit I work on. Oh, maybe because I was expecting to finish suit the 39 today. Yes. And so then I would have expected 41. Yes. But I think anyway, the second half of 39 is almost intelligible yeah. on its own. And I'm going to recapitulate just, you know, in five minutes what's covered in the first part of 39. So the best will be able to follow next week anyway. So don't worry that they're picking up in the middle of the suit. Okay, we can go up and take it. There's one more question from online. Just to see. Um, it's uh, my question is uh, Sampanjana. Clear comprehension in conflict with guarding the senses and not to grasp onto distant features and form. This clear comprehension conflict with, with guarding the senses and not to grasp onto distinct features and form. I don't see why it should conflict. Of course it doesn't conflict because it's part of the same training. Okay, I think we'll have to stop now. Stop now. Then we can take the lunch now and then come back. Well, because they're having the course, probably they're not opening the dining room. Eight. 